Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! This is Mary San Giovanni. Welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans, where once again, we are up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions. Now today, we're going to do something a little bit different. I have my very first guest on this show here, Paul Tremblay, author of Disappearance at Devil's Rock, Head Full of Ghosts, and his most recent book, which by the time this airs, will be out in bookstores in hardcover and ebook, right? Yep. Uh, which is Cabin at the End of the World. I'm very excited to have Paul because we're going to discuss cosmic horror from a slightly different angle. Now, Paul, you said that uh, that growing up, when mm-hmm. you were you know, in that sort of influential writer phase where you're reading, right. that Lovecraft almost was sort of like a... Like a a side art, like like it wasn't one of the first things that you read. No, definitely not. Um, that you've actually come to reading cosmic horror through other people, right. Who have emulated sort of a Lovecraftian style, like John Lang and, yeah. and and you know stuff like that. So I thought it would be interesting. I have been positing this theory over the course of the the episodes here that uh, cosmic horror has changed from the time of Lovecraft, mm-hmm. and you have since. Read Lovecraft, right? Yeah, I mean, not everything, but you know, I, I've read right. Call of Cthulhu and you know some of the, some of the most of the short stories, I guess. And because I because and you know and it's funny, uh, Paul was just a guest on the horror show with Brian Keene, and we had talked about how um, we think of you as sort of a, a literary, you know, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> sort of yeah. a literary quiet horror kind of guy. And I think in my head, I had always assumed that you wrote cosmic horror, but you don't really. I think you have cosmic horror elements in your work. Yeah, I've written a few like short stories here and there that I would call cosmic horror. Although, I mean, depending on your reading of the, ca- the cabin at the end of the world, if you read it a certain way, I think that definitely would be a cosmic it horror definitely interpretation. It. Yeah, but that wasn't necessarily your intention when you wrote it. Like you weren't necessarily thinking about that, or right? No, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think it's too spoilery. You know, if there's four strangers show up, that certainly echoes potentially the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So a very right. sort of oddly weirdly judeo-christian sort of approach or fear to, to what's happening in the book um but yeah i mean that's the ultimate or some of the ultimate cosmic horror potentially it is um, it, it is yeah. and we we'd also talked about you being uh a writer of, of sort of ambiguous horror and yeah. cosmic horror one of the elements i feel in cosmic horror is that um there is this element of the unknowable right or the unexplainable not so much in a sense that like okay i'm gonna uh you know slack off and not describe this thing but I, i'm just gonna say it, it is the undescribable the thing that which cannot be described right but do you feel that ambiguity play plays a part in, in cosmic horror like, how do you think that that contributes to the overall horror aspect the atmosphere of horror in general yeah no absolutely i mean i was just at your uh uh, MFA alma mater, Seton Hill, and yes. you know, I did like Woo-hoo! a. They had me do like an ambiguous horror workshop, and you know one of the things I did is I actually, I don't know I needed sort of a vessel to talk about, it, so I drew. And I, I can't draw at all, so it's a very funny looking <laughs> picture. But I I put uh, the scream uh, Edward Monk's the scream okay. on the okay. board as our map of ambiguity, and for the the red sky part of it, I wrote universe, you know super supernatural versus naturalism. Um, I mean, right. I know, to me, you know, part of the appeal of cosmic horror is the idea of existence itself as such an ambiguous thing. Like, we don't, you know, what are what are we all living through? We don't know. Uh, right. You know, you can make yourself kind of goofy and anxious and crazy thinking about it. But, you know, even if you approach it scientifically, the idea of the, the observation principle, right? Like, right. on a subatomic level, if you, you know, just the act of observing these really small pieces of, you know, atoms, et cetera. You know, you don't know if you're actually seeing it because the act of you observing is actually changing, changing what their it. behavior would be. And, you know, quantum physics and all that stuff. So, I don't know. To me, just, I mean, that's why I think I always kind of go back to ambiguity because I think, you know, we don't like to think about it. But we live in this state of ambiguity, like, from the personal level. Like, you know, how much is our identity 
how malleable it is it you know how much of our identity like relies upon what other people told about us you know like how you right. acted as a kid or right. you know the impact of society uh, your memories are so malleable etc but i mean you can certainly extrapolate all of that to you know the cosmic to to absolutely uh, to existence itself i mean from from if you look at people as sort of a, a microcosm of the universe anyway right. there is something to be said about a horror based on the ambiguity of your own sense of self you right. know that you really don't know yourself as well as you think you do there are a lot of narrators i think in cosmic horror who are unreliable narrators sure, yeah. and the narrator in cabin at the end of the world can be said to be an unreliable narrator yeah. right yeah all of them, um, definitely. and i i think that's 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 an interesting one of the things we've been looking at in the course of the show is, as i mentioned is is how modern cosmic horror often uses elements of cosmic horror, sometimes not all of them, and sometimes not in the way that it was used traditionally in the past. Right. So I've been able to sort of add things to a cosmic horror canon that I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily consider. Right. Um, when you think of cosmic horror, especially as somebody who didn't, say, grow up on Lovecraft, right. on a steady diet of Lovecraft, what do you think really typifies cosmic horror? Like, what, how would you define it? If you had to explain it to, say, the students at Seton Hill. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the idea that the, the universe is, you know, either inimical to you or actively <laughs> sort of against you. Right. But also, you know, I would try to worm in, like, the idea of the unexplainable. Um, you know, to me, so and I think that's the appeal of, you know, you mentioned John Lang, about, you know, Laird Barron's fiction. Uh, right. Livia right. Llewellyn's, too. Yeah, but I think they're all doing it through different ways. You know, I think part of the magic of Laird, why so many people are, I think, attached to him, is he takes those big ideas and puts it into, like, you know, uh, an almost a naturalistic setting. Like, it's out in the woods in, you know, northern Washington, or it's out in the right. woods, you know, or, right. you know, he's in Alaska. Um, so I think what, what all those writers do, and Olivia does it in a very sort of personal, erotic, sexual way. Right. But she has these bigger things happening, you know, in the cosmos, too. So I think, you know, what those writers do that's so interesting is they... To give a little bit more of a, a modern in, uh, a little bit more of a, it doesn't feel as stuffy. Right, right. <laughs> you, know, you know, I think they do stuff with the characters that, that able to, you know, because when I read Lovecraft, that's part of my hard time with it is. Right. You know, some of it is just the, the purple prose that he uses. It's right. not, I, I would never call it bad writing, but it's just, I don't know, for me it's, as a reader, I'm yeah. not. It's you know, antiquated. I, yeah, yeah. I, I just have a hard time getting into it. And he, there's a certain stiltedness about his characters which i think is more of a reflection of aspects of his own personality right. or his own fears than a deliberate choice to make them sort of these social right outsiders sure. you know um but you mentioned before the idea of supernaturalism versus naturalism right. and that's come up in the show too that this idea that a lot of times what you're looking at is the ambiguity of nature or the or the sort of awesome cosmic the, the connection of nature to the greater cosmos right. and um that it's it's sort of an indifferent power that a lot of these supernatural monsters are forces of nature just like any other disaster like right. a tornado or a hurricane and a lot of a lot of modern cosmic horror does i think do that more than um maybe even Lovecraft did, uh, right. you know, and, and there is also, like you said, a, a sense of putting the characters in a different context that, um, like m my impression from Laird stuff is that there's a certain nihilism there, which mm -hmm. you could see it, it, what, what I'm getting at is that it, it's interesting because I, I attribute it to, to a certain nihilism, but I think it's more like what you said, that it's a certain ambiguity. We yeah. don't know why we're doing any of this. Right. And I think it, it, in the past, it's been like, well, it's all for nothing because these cosmic monsters are bigger and, and scarier than we are. Right. But I don't think that's the case with modern cosmic car. Would yeah. you say, I mean, like, maybe no, Laird's I, not the best example right. of that. Cause no, I think, I think there's, there's a, a piece bit... of awe to it as well. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, that's almost part of just, you know, our culturally religious... You know, everyone, even if you're not a believer, I mean, it's part of the culture that whatever culture you grew in there, I mean, there's, right. you're going to be exposed to some religious, uh, you know, if not the, the faith itself, but at least to, um, what, what's the phrase I'm looking for? I don't know. You're going to be exposed to those stories, right? Right, right. You know, the, and, the sort and, of mythology behind yeah, it. Right. Yeah. And within that, I mean, within 
the worship it is that part of the awe, the ecstasy. And I think part of what, you know, Laird has and others too have in that is, you know, I think he has like a respect clearly for, it starts with the, with the natural first, like, you know, having, you know, grown right. up in the woods, he has a respect for sort of the mystery of, you know, what's going on around him, even though I'm sure he'd consider himself an expert woodsman. You know, right. he still, he'd be the first to say he doesn't know everything like that's out there. And he knows it. He, you know, he's come close to dying out, you know, in the wilderness. So he has, right, you know, that right. awe and respect of it. And I think that comes through in the fiction. He's able to extrapolate that into the grander sort of cosmic horror world. Right. right? I think that's pretty much a, 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 a like a, a, an important part of modern cosmic horror yeah. is this idea of um, awe maybe replacing cynicism, yeah. particularly in a, I think in a, a climate of pessimism and, and jadedness to begin with. Sure, yeah. You know, but like the, the stuffy aspect, because I know exactly what you're talking about. Like there is a certain uh, stiltedness, a stuffiness to a lot of Lovecraftian stuff mm-hmm. that this other stuff that, that we've talked about on the show that borders Lovecraft in right. terms of cosmic horror doesn't have. And I think that has a lot to do with character. Now, you're a character guy. Yeah. You're a character driven guy. <laughs> Um, what do you think is an important aspect of character development in quiet horror, which would maybe overlap into cosmic horror? Um, boy, I kind of, even though all the stories end up being different, mm-hmm. um, you know, sort of taking a little bit, like John Clute wrote a, a giant essay about, you know, what he thought horror was. And I don't think he has it totally right, but I think a part of it, I, I like a part of what he does say about horror in general. He thinks, you know, so many horror stories is about uh, this idea that there's a reveal of this great and terrible truth, and it could be a personal truth, or it could right. be, a, a, or right. in terms of cosmic horror, a truth about the universe. Right. Um, you know, and the horror can be like the affect of that reveal of that truth. So, I guess, you know, when I try to write my stories, and again, this is just what I'm comfortable with, I certainly wouldn't say every horror story has to be done this way, right. but... Yeah, so I like that idea of this reveal of this awful truth. So to me, I like to focus on the characters and how they deal with it's how they deal with that reveal. Like, so if this happens in the middle of the story, there's a big reveal. What I find interesting is how are the characters? What, you know, what are the decisions they're going to make after they know this? Right. You know, do they know the right. consequences? You know, and then like, what's the cascade of effects after they make these decisions? After they have had this horrific experience or the reveal of this horrific truth? Yes, um, I agree. So certainly, I mean, I think that would totally fit into you know a cosmic horror context i think john langan is someone who focuses on uh characters quite a bit like in a similar way i do right but right. you know one of the things i really admire about john's work is you know he'll do like this quiet character stuff but he also still has these amazingly cool monsters yes <laughs> you yes. know in his stories yes. um, and i think like i feel like sometimes like i'm a coward in my horror stories because i can't fully commit to go into like the full supernatural, the full cosmic. Right. You know, and I, I feel right. like sometimes I'm cheating because I'm playing, oh, is it real or not? <laughs> but, you know, John gets to do both because, you know, he's such a brilliant writer. See, I, I, I like that. I like that about, about John's stuff. Um, and two, I think that's part of the evolution of cosmic horror is, is, like you said, like I think with Lovecraft, the great reveal of the terrible truth was the horror. Right. And that's kind of, he just sort of, you know, mic dropped there and walked away. Right. I think a lot of modern cosmic horror, though, looks at the aftermath of the revelation of the great and terrible truth because i think that's where we are kind of as a as a society you right. know is, is looking at a lot of the aftermaths of these horrific tragedies you know whether it's school shootings or planes ramming into buildings or orange-haired nightmares getting elected to you know right. into government is is this idea of um the the strength or the weakness in people how how these traumas change them you know how these terrible truths change them absolutely and i mean in the situations you could put them in are endless right i mean right. i mean so obviously lovecraft was i don't know if i could call him the first i'm not as well read as some people with like <laughs> you know hope hodgson etc right, but right. you know the idea that it built it up to the reveal so now you can take like the reveal you can take this horrible cosmic truth and you can put it in you know where you talk about alaska or we can put it in new york city in a right very right. sort of personal erotic sort of situation like if livia is working on it or you know, with John, sometimes he puts it in an academic setting or like with a family unit. So I don't know. It's just to me, it's that's the fun of horror. Like even though you've had all, you've seen some of these things before, it's new again because of you know the writers that are filtering it through their own experience, and it's new because of the characters that they're you know messing around with. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I think a lot of people 
um, tend to think that cosmic horror is sort of a dead in the water kind of situation because they think of it as stopping at Lovecraft or yeah. with Lovecraft pastiches, I guess. And that's not the case. Like, I think a lot of cosmic horror is very vibrant yeah. and, and beautifully written and extensive. But I think you have to be, much like with horror in general, you have to be willing to look outside the, the general boundaries of what people think is horror right. or think is cosmic horror and see like, oh, well, this has you know, elements of this or this has elements of this. And uh, one of the things I think that people overlook is like what Livia does, that uh, erotic cosmic horror. Right. Because I wouldn't... I would say that, and, and and again, I'm not an expert on Lovecraft's life, and and mm -hmm. but I do get the impression that he was somewhat asexual. Yeah, um, very repressed. Just not in, yeah, right. either very Probably repressed not. or just not interested yeah, in some way. Um, however, there are a lot of sexual undertones to cosmic horror, uh, for even his work. Sure, yeah, you know, I think I there's, mean, there's certainly like a fear or a, or a lack of understanding of. You know, exactly. how sex works. I mean, yeah, yeah, that there's a that there's a, a fear of, or just a fear of women and sure. the, the power right. of what their bodies can yep. hold and, and, you know, the power of giving birth. You know, there is sort of a, a and with him, I think maybe that that may be considered a flaw. That, yeah. yeah. Women are these kind of scary, <laughs> monstrous beings capable of birthing other beings. But uh, but there is a sexuality to it. There right. is a sort of eroticism, you know inherent in even like the way he describes monsters i mean a lot of these things are you know long tentacled yep. you know invasive <laughs> yeah rape monsters right, right. <laughs> you know i mean and i don't know that that gets a lot of acknowledgement in in it that there that there is a, a certain sexuality to it because he moves from being all supernatural and over the course of his career toward uh a, a more natural explanation for hmm. these things that they're aliens right. as opposed to just these you know gods right that there there actually is a sort of scientific background and that there's a, a biology to it that they want to reproduce or that they want to you know meet with humans i mean if you think about uh you know shadow over his mouth you know that's that's fish sex <laughs> that's right. a lot of fish <laughs> sex <laughs> you know a lot of trading people for uh for tr for treasure and whatnot and um I think it's I think it's interesting that people tend to to sort of put a lot of his stuff in a box as being like this is what it is because he he what we were talking about how once you sort of establish a pattern in your own writing yeah I I think you reach a point where you want to vary that a little bit absolutely you yeah. know because we were talking about like with you um, the last three books are the sort of ambiguous horror thing and you maybe want to branch out and right. try something maybe more direct mm -hmm. or you know in, in just sort of a different vein yeah, yeah. i've run into the same thing too because i've been writing pretty much cosmic horror my whole career and i would like to try something more ambiguous you know in terms of it being supernatural or not i right. did i tried something more violent and you know and and as brian mentioned when talking about cabin at the end of the world you have a scene that's particularly yeah there's a few <laughs> yeah particularly uh violent yeah i think that Cosmic horror is also a lot of times discounted because it's, you know, these people sort of, you know, fainting and, and, and shocked and appalled by uh, either that undertone of sex or this violence that is never fully realized. Right. I think in modern cosmic horror, though, it is. It is realized. And in quiet horror in particular, I think there are, you know, scenes of extreme violence. They're just told a different way right what do you think about that about violence in cosmic or quiet horror and how it, how it is best approached as she, a writer yeah she's I, I i don't know if i could speak to how it's used in cosmic horror just because i haven't written a ton of it so i wouldn't want to like come off as like oh this is how you're supposed <laughs> to do this it is how you horror. do it <laughs> um i don't know like you know so for, with cabin there was going to be this i knew there was going to be violence and mm -hmm. so the type of story it is with the home invasion story where there's only like you know seven characters total you know, felt like, okay, the violence is going to have to be, like, really up close and personal. Right, you right. Know, and for that story, you know, this wouldn't work for all stories. You, you know, I like what you were saying earlier about for the cosmic horror stories that, the you know, these are forces of nature. It's a different kind of violence. Right, Where right. you can do, like, bigger things. Um, 
you know, you know, as you said, like a, almost treated as like it's a tsunami or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. So you know, with the cabin, there's these characters that are going to know each other on some level before <laughs> a violent act happens. So for I guess the quiet horror story, like I try to approach the violence as I almost described it actually this weekend when I was at Seton Hill, I described it as to try to treat the violence with a, a dignity and respect, which might seem weird. Yes. Yes. But, no, I absolutely but, know what you mean. But more, I guess, treat the experience with a, a dignity. So what I, I guess what I mean by that is. You know, again, if it's a small set of characters, if there's a violent act, you know, I think obviously the person who's having the act upon is going to be affected. Right. You know, whether or not right. she or he survives. Um, but the witnesses and even the, the people perpetrating the act, they're all never going to be the same. Right. You know, for anybody listening, you know, if you've ever experienced a violent act as one of those three. Yes. You know, unfortunately, like, you know, that's true. That's like a point. That's a marker in your time. Like, yes, you are not the same after that act. So. Right. I guess in the quiet horror story, that's kind of you know what you would do. And I you yeah, know. and I think I think an emphasis on the effect of the violence, right, as opposed to the violent act itself. Like you said, a dignity. It's not puerile. It's not told in this sort of goofy like he he let's let's laugh at boobs sure. sort of way. Right. There is a, a certain gravitas, I think. Yeah, given. It, it depends on the story. Like I mean, right. Listen, I'm, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say you know all violence has to be treated that way because it does not. It depends right, on the absolutely. story. Like, it you know, one of my story. Some two of my favorite movies of all time are Evil Dead Two and Reanimator. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know the violence there are used to, to to a different end, obviously right. in those movies. And I would I would venture to say that there's a little bit of cosmic horror in Evil Dead. Yeah, even, no, you know, in the way absolutely. that absolutely that's approached, because I think that's the other thing that I've I've you know offered on this show is that I don't think that violence and quiet horror are as mutually exclusive as a lot of people tend to think. Right. Same with cosmic horror. I think that. A lot of cosmic horror looks at the, at, like we said before, the reactions to uh, violence, the reaction as opposed to the violence itself. The violence right. itself is there only to establish the seriousness of the threat, and the story is how people deal with that threat. Right. And along those, I, I think along those same lines, I think the the monsters are especially. I, I think. Maybe maybe more in quiet horror and cosmic horror than in um, maybe more pulp stuff. I think they're more representations of something. Sure. Yeah. You know, they're more representations of uh, a certain psychological aspect. There's a lot of psychology going on. Absolutely. In in that kind of horror. Um, and I had another point, but I forgot what I was going to say. And it was sh- brilliant, no doubt. The people. cosmic horror of uh, mayflies. <laughs> oh my God! Well, yes, actually, it was. It was. It was a nature thing. That's where I was going yeah. with that. Is that. I think in a lot of cosmic horror, part of the horror stems from the fact that these things aren't really evil. They're only perceived as evil by us because they want to hurt us. Right. No, definitely. But they're actually indifferent to us, which is, I think, what Lovecraft tried to, you know, basically beat over our heads with his pantheon is that they're not evil. They just don't care. No, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Or they have, exactly, or they have their own motivations, which in a lot of cases just biological survival absolutely they want to survive so that's why they're doing what they're doing and i get the impression that that's the case with your antagonists in cabinet at the end of the world that whether or not it's evil by subjective standards is right. kind of irrelevant because they have a m- motivation right they feel like they have no choice um which is a you know a scary thing to me and i think that yes. you know gets into metaphysical cosmic Right. ideas because you know especially if you're a human character as opposed to a monster if you feel like you have to do something because you have no choice there's like a sneaky uh appeal slash relief to that that scares me um, yes because yes. once you feel like you're gonna there's no choice in the matter you're abdicating responsibility you're abdicating absolutely you're ab- abdicating the we the did contract. as we were told <laughs> right yeah, or the compact the human compact you're abdicating yes. that's why i think cults and cosmic horror go hand in hand because absolutely the people who you know to me i find that fascinating and super scary a part of cosmic horror is who are these people that are so willing to basically give up their humanity or the you know the social contract to go over into a cult and you know where is that line between cults and religion because i would never be so obnoxious to say all religions are cults because they're not right right. you know there are plenty of people who are religious who you know still believe they have personal responsibility right you know even though you know they, they worship a god or mm-hmm. or you know whatever they they end up worshiping 
Um, it's a factor in their life, but not yeah, absolutely. the thing that, you know, absolutely overtakes it, which is, right. I think, how religion should be, yeah. I think. But I think with, yeah, uh, with, with cultists, it, it, it's interesting. In, in a lot of cult, like a lot of the cult stuff that Lovecraft describes, the cultists are like base creatures. They're almost like animals. Yeah, no, they are. Um, they've they're, been reduced. You know, yeah. They're absolutely this. Uh, he describes them a lot of times, and this is where a lot of his, you know, racism comes in, is this sort of degenerate uh, group of people. Right. Uh, there's, and there's a suggestion that the, the degeneration comes from their uh, incorporating practices of, say, like voodoo or sure. Santeria or, all, you know, those, those kind of um, old world country, even paganism, right. you know, into that. But uh, there is something terrifying about people that we want to consider human beings right who abdicate a certain amount of their humanity in order to to make yeah. these things happen. i mean to me any cult story is uh, on some level a, a cosmic horror story like whether or yes. not there is something actually cosmically happening mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but the idea that you know this group of people are giving themselves over to this whatever supposed right higher power this greater is. force yeah than humanity yeah absolutely absolutely do you think you'd ever be inclined to write a straight up cosmic horror kind of kind of um, novel I mean, something yeah, no, like no. I mean, something I, I with Langan-esque monsters yeah. in it. You know, um, I've written I, some def I would call cosmic horror short stories. I wrote one short story with a giant monster, but not everything I do is ambiguous. But this one is <laughs> like you don't know if the monster is real or not. Right, right. Um, no, yeah, I would love to. Uh, I just, you know, I'd have to figure out what the idea is. I sort of wrote like a 30-page summary for a novel that sort of cosmic horror-y, but my, right. my editor wasn't crazy about it. Um, so I don't know. Maybe someday I'll go back to it. But honestly, I think I overwrote it because I mean, thirty pages for a summary is like that's yeah. ridiculous. It's yeah. almost like I almost like dreaded writing it because I already felt like I wrote the story. <laughs> right. Right. Um, no, I know. I know what you mean. That's yeah, I, I don't know. Doing. I wish I was a writer like John or somebody who has you know just there. I know he already has like tons of ideas in his head. The idea, you know, you hear like Neil Gaiman. I think it was you know maybe someone else said it, but oh, I'll, I wish I could live long enough to write all the stories that I have in my head. I'm like, man. I know. <laughs> Maybe it's the math part of me, but like I have like one at a time. Me too. You know, me and too. I feel like I have to work to come up with it. I wish I had like a rotating thing of. Right. I wish I had five novels waiting to be written. Cause I, me too. I'm I think having a hard enough time off. coming yeah. up with the one that I'm supposed to do for next summer or that's due next summer. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I would love to try all sorts of different types of horror. It's just a matter of you know me finding the story that. Right. That I think I could do. <laughs> and I, I know what you mean. I, I I've wanted to try some. Some thrillers, some. It's one one of the things that Kensington's having me do is because I have um, they they they're pushing these last few books as a series. Yeah. And so I have a recurring character who's, I, I guess, to oversimplify, she's an occult detective. She's an occult yeah. consultant kind of person. The reason I picked that is because I I was thinking that there is some versatility, like Repairman mm. Jack, like oh, uh, yeah, Paul yeah. Wilson's Repairman right. Jack. I can do cosmic horror with her where she actually deals with the supernatural aspects. I can do thrillers where she just deals with cult members. Yeah. And it's not so far a variation, I think. Um, one of the things I think is important about, you know, establishing cosmic horror as this, as this still living and vibrant subgenre is versatility. Mm. Uh, because otherwise you do end up to, like I've had more trouble uh, I, I pitched to a publisher, I pitched a mythos novel. And I love Lovecraft stuff. Yeah. I do. I, I love cosmic horror stuff in general. Uh, and I've had trouble with it because if it's a mythos story, I'm bound by certain rules that I tend to break when I do my own cosmic horror. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to hear um, your perspective that a lot of the things that you know we've been talking about in the show about where cosmic horror is going in the future um, that, you know, independently, even not with, you know, having so heavy a cosmic horror background that you, that you agree with that. So I think yeah. that's kind of awesome. Well, thanks. So I think we're probably getting close to, to 20 minute to our, our, our 20 and 30 minute mark where we usually say how, how uh, awesome Dave is. This is the part where we break <laughs> in and we talk about how awesome Dave is. I, first of Dave all, though, I awesome. do, I want to thank you for being on the show. This is my very first interview oh, cool. on cosmic no, uh, shenanigans I mean, and, I thought our shenanigans were, were, were pretty intellectual. You know, I, I like <laughs> yeah, when we have intellectual shenanigans. shenanigans. Yeah. Um, 
So thank you for being on the show. Again, thank Paul you, Tremblay's book, The Cabin at the End of the World, is now out in it's hardcover out. and in ebook. Is it going to be in paperback? It will be. I'm not nine months to a year later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure of that date yet. It's an audio now. Too, and it's though. audio yeah. and an yeah. audio book too. So, so definitely check that out because Paul is awesome. Oh, and uh, speaking of awesome people, Dave Thomas is awesome for engineering. If you are interested in watching Dave in all of his glory on Twitch, he is on twitch.tv slash meteor notes. Uh, you can also check out the horror show with Brian Keene where Dave and Brian and I and Paul, yeah. this this uh, past episode, uh, talked about horror and, and, and all of its glory and had a lot of giggles. We had more. I think we had more yeah. shenanigans on the horror <laughs> show with Brian Keene. Uh, if you are interested in advertising, then you can go to the uh, Project Entertainment Network website. I keep meaning to check if this is true because I keep telling people it is. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> you can click on the... Uh, advertising button i think it's a little gray button i want to say i think it's like somewhere in the upper right hand corner and you can click on that and get all the information you need to advertise on cosmic shenanigans and if you are interested in listening to see i'm doing this with, with, without notes people this is all this is all fly <laughs> by the seat of my pants i'm doing this without a net very impressive thank you thank you um if you are interested in listening to cosmic shenanigans past present and future because all are one in cosmic shenanigans uh, that was a little Lovecraft reference. See what I did there? See what I did there? Uh, yeah. um, if you're interested in listening to past, present, and future episodes, you can do so on the Project Entertainment Network, uh, Libsyn Pro. If you put in Cosmic Shenanigans Libsyn Pro, it comes right up uh, in Google. Or you can listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, uh, pretty much any place where uh podcasts are downloadable. Rio yours is phone. Rio yours is phone. We were <laughs> discussing on uh, the horror show that our, our, our my intro with Tim Levin and Rio yours and how it is probably the most shenanigans-esque <laughs> aspect of the show because they use the old title that I was going to go with shenanigans and Sue and that uh, Rio pronounces my name in a very um, anglophile sort of way. <laughs> Um, which, which delights me every time I hear it. The, those two guys are awesome. I think Rio is the personification of cosmic shenanigans, or shenanigans and Sue both at the same yes, time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the two of them together. <laughs> it's a lot of shenanigans. So, uh, so anyway, thanks, folks, for listening, and we will be back next week with more shenanigans of a cosmic proportion. And I'll see you then. Bye. Bye. The Necrocasticorn. The podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties with a common connection. Brought to you by hosts, Talking Tom Clock, Max Axe, Smoking Hot Hades, and Azriel Mordecai. Featuring interviews and more with the stars of metal and horror. The Necrocasticon, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network.